This is almost our last regular platform. I invite all of you next Sunday when we have our Sunday school graduation, which is the last Sunday of the regular season, and then we start our summer services after that. Uh, and that's going to be at a new time, which is, help me remember, 10, 10 a.m. to give you time to get out and get about and enjoy uh, the summer, which I highly recommend that we all need to do that. So that's why I wanted to talk a little bit today about adventures and the importance of adventures. You know, I told you that, that uh, Buddhist parable a second ago, but actually I'm reminded more of a uh, story that Jean-Paul Sartre, she, he was the French philosopher of existentialism, uh, followed after Kierkegaard and kind of developing that idea. And he tells a different story, but somewhat similar. And it's about five travelers who are heading up a mountain and they're going up and it's a fairly difficult path and really narrow. They're clinging to the edge of this. And all of a sudden they're almost to the, you know, around the bend and they're in this difficult spot. And, you know, they helped each other along to a certain extent. And then they get to this place and all of a sudden they are boom, boom, boom. And down the mountain comes a gigantic boulder and it plops itself right in the path in front of them. So there they are. They're on this very, very tight pathway. They got really scared that the rock had almost forced them off the edge and things like that. And they're so difficult, uh, you know, that difficult place at that time. And they're trying to figure out what to do. And one of them says, well, you know what? I bet I can find a pathway around there. There's got to be another way up this mountain. Let me, let me go take a look and I'll just figure out a way to keep on going. One of them says, why does this always happen to me? Every time I'm on a trip, something happens and goes wrong, and he sits down on the ground and starts to cry. One of them was a geologist says, well, that's weird. This rock is sedimentary, and most of this mountain is quartz. How could that be? Where's my, my uh, spyglass? I want to look at this. The other says, well, we might as well just go home. There's no sense going further, and that's all there is to it. Let's go up. And then one of them sits on the edge of the cliff, and looks out and goes, this has got to be the best view of the valley I have ever seen. Now, Jean-Paul Sartre uses the parable to say that all of these people encounter the same exact challenge in life, right? A boulder had fallen on the hill. But each of them, according to him in his kind of existential way, says they make a choice about what they want to do at that particular situation. We make choices. And so... Part of what I want to talk today is about the kind of choices that we all have. We all getting a little bit older, don't really move as well. Maybe there's something that's going to stop and we may not have as uh, abilities to do the things that we do, but we still continue to make choices. Thinking of you, young lady, uh, Marion Claxton, who was almost dancing up the aisles a couple of weeks ago and telling us uh, about being in the society and why she liked being here. What was great is the fact that she put so much joy. My son absolutely adored you. And he kept talking about that woman who made everybody laugh. Uh, he thought you were absolutely great. And yet, yet you had suffered some vertigo a few weeks before that or had felt some dizziness and told people that you still had these kind of stuff. But once again, we make choices, right? We find out where we are and we continue to make choices. So I wanted to start a slideshow. So I'm gonna share my screen uh, and one second. Okay, let's see if you can see that online. We can see it, we can see it great. Okay, great. Until the computer crashes, we're going good. So uh, I want to talk a little bit about adventures and ethical adventures on top of that. Let's see if this advances okay. So the first thing I want to bring up to you is kind of a question. You know, I always think of this because I'm an ethical culture leader. What would be an ethical culture's list of spiritual practices. We often don't think of that. We don't have prayer. We don't really read Bibles. We don't uh, do those kinds of things, of course. Uh, but we do other kinds of things. And I always frequently tell people that community building is almost a spiritual practice for us, right? To walk into a place 
Uh, and I've seen the power of this, not only within the ethical societies, but in my work as an environmentalist, to walk into a place that's disconnected with broken pieces and polluted pieces of land, disenfranchisement, uh, and then to slowly weave together elements into the community. Suddenly that piece of land gets revitalized, it gets cleaned up and it becomes a place for uplifting. And I always thought of that, that even though I was no longer in a full-time pulpit, I was still doing the work as an ethical culture leader of bringing in my training from the ethical culture folk uh, to make that happen. I always thought of that as a spiritual practice. Relationship building is another one I think is really important to us, which is central to Adler, right? That we are who we are because of the people who come in our lives, you heard me say at the memorials recently, that we are not just me's, we are we's in a way. We're collections of ideas and influences and the people who come into our lives and how important that is and how important it is to choose good relationships and to continue to work with them. I bet I could go through and have a story with each of you that there was someone that no one had uh, any desire to make a connection with, but somehow you did, right? Somehow that one person you connected with and, and life was different for, for all of you because of that. I often think of caring as an ethical culture value, right? Wellness, uh, anti-violence, uh, giving people choice over their bodies, building hospital schools like the Philston Ethical Culture School built there. Before they even built the Ethical Society, they built Philston School. I don't know if you knew that. The school was built before they had a hall for getting together and doing meetings, right? Uh, that's it. <clears throat> Still today, sitting there in Manhattan. Uh, and you said you went to school there? You went to the Brooklyn, she went to the Ethical Culture School in Brooklyn. I bet most of you didn't know that. We also had a school there. Yeah. Yeah, that's pretty amazing. Yeah. <laughs> but I also think it's, <laughs> I also think it's the exploration of ideas, of exploration of, of data, of thinking through things, which is kind of a value, right? That we don't just take things on matters of faith. We're always remain a little bit skeptical of trying to figure out, is that the best way to be? Can we explore new ideas? Can we look at the data? Can we continue to move forward? And can we make choices along the way that do those things? And of course, ethical action is central to a lot of us. This society does quite a bit of it. Ann Wallman, I don't know if she's online, uh, and her committee and all the people who out there all the time doing uh, uh, actions and things like that. And this summer, I hope to be uh, engaging a bunch of youth. I got the money together. I think I have all the money I need now for the youth program. Uh, just had some meetings that come this week. We're gonna hire a bunch of young people, not a bunch. I have a small group this year, but hire youth to also to do things and to continue that work as well. In fact, I emailed one of our park partners and I said, you, just by chance, there's probably no reason for this, but if you have a little bit more money, could you let me know? He called me back an hour later. So oh, I've got money for you, please come. So I'm gonna throw out a few more of those phone calls, emails, see what happens. But I think the last a spiritual value uh, that we practice, and there are probably other ones, is adventure. And I think it's important to adventure and to go out and be a part of the world, lest we end up in a pretty small way of thinking. I've always wondered why, I'm from a very, very, very tiny town in South Texas, and I always wondered why maybe my experiences led me here, whereas a lot of uh, the people I knew in South Texas never left that town and tend to have very similar thought patterns that I had when I was a kid about being leery of strangers, about Yankees who were trying to destroy our culture and people coming in from the outside. Uh, it's kind of a sense of uh, fear that I think drives so much of the people down there, the fear of everything, and hence these push towards guns and building walls and all this kind of stuff. And I go back to them and I, they always ask me, what's the difference between people in New York they would ask, and I've had friends when I'd go back, I said, they're not afraid. They have fears, maybe they don't like spiders or bugs or something like that, I don't know. Things that we would just look at and go, here's a bug. Uh, but they don't fear difference, they don't fear people, they have conversations, they don't seem to get upset about it the way that people do in other parts of the country. So I always wondered why that was so much different. And I think what it is is that my parents love an adventure when we were kids and always taking us places and seeing that there was a world out there that was very, very different. 
It also is the fact that when I was a kid, my father worked for an airline, aircraft manufacturing company, and they invited a bunch of workers to come over from India, and they worked at his factory, and then we trained them in how to be Americans and how to do that. So 22 young Indian men would come over to our house every single week, and we would take them to the grocery store shopping, and we would do all this good stuff. And they didn't have a television set. They didn't have any money at all, zero money. Uh, and so uh, they didn't have a TV set. So on Friday nights, they would come over and they would babysit my brother and I, 22 men, uh, while my parents uh, went off and, um, uh, you know, went out for the night and got away from their kids. Uh, it was perfect for them. And what was interesting about them is the fact that they, uh, they would, they loved wrestling and they'd get so excited. We'd put on this silly wrestling shows, you know, with Wahoo McDaniels, this famous Texas wrestler and all these things. And people are going crazy and they're running around the house. And they're wrestling each other in front of us. All this kind of stuff. It was total, absolute mayhem. Uh, they thought it was great. And uh, we had a lot of fun. And then I'd ask them questions like, well, where are you from? And there were different religions. They weren't all the same religion and they were different caste. I heard this weird social stratus that hopefully Indians will eventually move away from. Uh, they had all these other kinds of things that were going on. And they had this food. And this food was so oddly different from anything I'd ever experienced. And so I always felt like that also had a big impact that I realized that not everybody in South Texas thought in the same way. Now, I lived on the border near Mexico, not far from the border. We went to Mexico a thousand times in my life because I actually lived and worked right on the border. We'd go there for dinner and I knew there was other worlds around there, things like that. And I was just surprised that there were people in Texas who lived 20 miles away from Mexico and who never went to Mexico. And I just thought, I'd look at them and shake my head like, there's a whole world, different world, 10 miles from. We used to go there 14, 15 years old. My parents would say, I don't care. We'd go to Mexico drink <laughs> probably at that age and then come back it was a horrible thing i never forget to, to tell you a story come back to the border we're all coming in and they, they would ask what country are you from and invariably everybody in the line would say we're from texas they go that's not a country <laughs> and we look at them like i'm from texas that's not a country what country are you from i'm from texas what country <laughs> the united states that's a country <laughs> And then they'd let us in. It was silly because that's all we knew, right? So uh, I think having a spirit of adventure young and early. Now, I, the people who are in this room, I would imagine are probably similar to that, the sense of love and adventure and doing things and seeing things. I think that's one of the things that lends itself to being an ethical person. So what I did is to say, okay, what are my 10, top 10, quick off the top of my head trips that I think somebody may want to take this summer. Now, some of these you may have done. These are not, there are probably other things. I'm forgetting the obvious things that I figured you'd all be there. I tried to think what are 10 things that maybe you haven't done. And then we're going to, at the end, if you like one of them, I will organize a group trip to do, to do that as well. So we're going to go through here, Kurt Collier's top 10 ethical adventures of, for this summer of 2022 of things that you might consider doing on your own or doing with us. Number one is I call this category the journeys to freedom. And some of you probably have done this, gone to the African burial ground in Manhattan. Uh, it is a wonderful new monument that, that was put in there, uh, paying tribute to the, to the African people who used to live uh, when, when um, Manhattan was really just a southern tip bound by the battery. Uh, the African uh, people who had brought in enslaved were often lived in that area. They were kicked out of that area. Where did they go after that? Central Park, which became Central Park right before Central Park, they were kicked out of that land. Where did they go after that? The Harlem and then up to the Bronx, right? And so that was it. And I think it's nice to go there to pay tribute. It's a gorgeous memorial and to talk about that it's not just Dutch and British history, uh, that what also built America and built New York, of course, was the African people who we don't have many monuments to them. So it's time we did that. I would then hike the one mile down the road past uh, the building where you can see they shot the movie Ghostbusters. 
uh, past the area where the, the FBI created secret tests on people in Greenwich and, and put drugs on them and see what happened to them uh, and end up in the Stonewall Inn. That's the little place there in Manhattan where the great gay rights movement started. You can go in there, have a drink. Have you been to a gay bar lately? No, we haven't. Well, that'd be kind of a fun thing to do. It's a new ethical adventure and end up in the place where you live nearby the Stonewall Inn where the famous riot took place uh, that started the whole ethical culture movement. So that's a mile little hike and maybe that might be something we could do as a group. The second thing is the city of the future. And there's some very, very interesting things going on in Manhattan. One of them, of course, uh, is this whole revolution around green infrastructure. Manhattan has the money to do these things that other cities don't. One of them is Gotham Greens, which is one of the world's largest rooftop gardens at one time. I think there are bigger places than that now. Uh, the great thing about Gotham Greens is that it's a whole farm located on top of the city. Urban agriculture in Brooklyn is a $1 billion business. Urban agriculture in Brooklyn, New York. Brooklyn, urban agriculture is a $1 billion business. And these people have figured out what the city of the future would look like of how we get our food, where it comes from. You can visit the farms and go through the greenhouses. I know these people and I'm hoping to get my, some of my partners maybe to give us a tour. The other is the digester. Anybody seen that at Newtown Creek? As you're driving across, there's some bridge that goes between Brooklyn and Queens. What is that? That bridge? Huh? Cascuse. Ah, Kosciusko Bridge. Uh, you can see this off in the distance. This is Newtown Creek, and Manhattan also has some of the most innovative uh, water treatment plants and sewage treatment plants in the United States. These are giant digesters. This is now a museum at a water park. Uh, interesting thing. You can walk through this, and there are hiking trails that go down to Newtown Creek. They're restoring and all this kind of stuff, and they teach you about how the city of the future will handle water treatment and purification and things like this in this very innovative way that Manhattan has. That's the second journey. I used to go over that every day on New you used to go to Newtown Creek to Newtown High School. Yeah. How did you find out? Uh, okay, all right. Yeah. yeah this, this smells like marijuana. It tastes like marijuana. Okay. Thank you for sharing this story. The next one I'm going to call from the past to the future. How many of you in this room have been to Ellis Island? See there, that's ethical culture folk. You'd be surprised at how many times I talk to people in New York and they have never been there. It's been recently remodeled. Uh, it's got new exhibits inside of that. It's another wonderful trip to go there and to think about it. They're much better at their interpretation now, which uh, the, the past was not as, as powerful as it is now. So if you haven't been lately, some of you probably went when you were in grade school, maybe your school trip, time to go back and visit Ellis Island and remember about the, the way we came in and look at all the new exhibits that they put in there. The other, of course, is then to head right over down the end of the block to Liberty Science Center and go to one of the largest largest planetariums in the United States and see these wonderful planetarium shows at Liberty Science. Anybody been to Liberty Science there? Yep, of course you have. Uh, there's a lot of hand raising when I ask these questions in the room, just so you know. But that might be kind of another fun trip and it's a way of thinking, they're right next to each other, of thinking about the past and the future of our cities. Now, the other one I would highly recommend is the Great Swamp National Wildlife Refuge. Anyone been there? Yeah, we got a few more in the room. Uh, did you know that that was the first designated refuge wilderness area in the United States? What was that supposed to be? What was the Great Swamp supposed to be? It was going to be the Newark Airport, right? And before they were going to put the Newark Airport in, they decided to put it here. It was just a swampy piece of land. That's actually a remnant, a very tiny remnant of the massive lake that used to be here during the glaciated periods, right? So there was a gigantic lake that went all the way up through. That's the reason why you have Patterson Great Falls because so much water poured through there. Uh, and then that's the last part of an ancient 30,000-year-old lake. Uh, that's the last piece of it. The Great Swamp uh, was actually saved by the people who said, no, we're not going to put uh, uh, an uh, airport on top of this swamp. And it's also one of the great urban um, uh, 
uh, restoration successes and how much they preserve. They've now, it's up to 7,200 acres uh, in the Great Swamp area. Uh, it has a lovely exhibit there. Uh, this is where I used to bring my youth to have them trained in how to be docent wilderness naturalists. Uh, and we hope to bring ethical culture folks there too. They'll train our youth when we get to that point as well. And you can see owls, lots of owls hanging out on the woods too. Now, uh, I call this enjoying the four freedoms because in the, at the end of Roosevelt Park, of course, uh, Roosevelt Island uh, is the Roosevelt Monument. Has anyone been to the new Roosevelt Monument on the end? Of, oh, there we go. No one raised their hand on that one. It's a beautiful, beautiful park right on the very southern tip of Roosevelt Island, right in the center of the East River. Uh, you could take the tramway over to the island, of course, and then hike down there. As you go, you pass by the smallpox uh, quarantine hospital which is now all fallen down it's got trees growing until it's because stuff really looks spooky but it also reminds you of what it was like when people got smallpox back then and how they dealt with it which was actually building sanitariums on islands and they would put people on those islands right or like typhoid mary supposedly uh that's where she ended up all this kind of stuff uh, on the islands go there but i think it's also to remember the four freedoms of roosevelt i you can name them Freedom from want, freedom from fear. You might know. Huh? <laughs> I think that was his want. Yeah, yeah. And then freedom of religion and freedom of want, freedom of fear, freedom of religion, and freedom of speech. Yeah. Uh, as far as his important ones, what he would, his justification for us to going to war. Uh, and uh, when's the last time anyone here has been actually on a tour inside the United Nations? Have you been? Yeah, nice to go back. They've reopened the building. Uh, this was, of course, given by the Scandinavian countries donated the money for designing these buildings. They're absolutely gorgeous inside. Has anyone ever seen the chapel there? You yeah, have? Yeah, it's very weird. <laughs> There's just a stone block. I couldn't agree with, like, how do you represent religion from around the world? It's a stone block and a bunch of chairs and some light. And there's Mark Chagall uh, stained glass inside there. Yeah, beautiful thing. Uh, I like to go to the United Nations. I'm probably one of the few people, you know, when I come to New York, I would see everything. And you could go there and you can mail yourself a postcard because it's fun to mail yourself. They have their own stamp because it's its own country, right? It's not longer the United States when you enter the United Nations. You're actually in an unceded territory uh, given to the world and you can mail yourself and then you have this United Nations stamp. And then uh, the Rose Reading Room, which has recently also been restored at the New York Public Library. Anybody been there? Yep, a couple of people been, huh? Yeah, so they restored it. It is now open as well as the United Nations. That might be kind of a fun trip. And then maybe if we have a very adventurous group, we'll go up to Roosevelt Island, take the tram across, go past the smallpox hospital and end up at the, the monument to Franklin Roosevelt, if anyone's interested in that. Now, the other thing that you have here in New Jersey, of course, is the home of the famous nature writer John Burroughs. John Burroughs was a contemporary with Jack London. Jack London was writing Call of the Wild and Nanook of the North in those books. Uh, John Burroughs wrote him and had a very fierce debate with him in the newspaper. That's Burroughs right here on the cabin, which still sits there in New Jersey. Uh, and Yep, I think it's New Jersey. <laughs> and basically, John Burroughs said the problem with Jack London's books is he really wasn't a nature writer. He was writing stories where the animals were all humans disguised as, you know, because they, they, they had motives, they had thought, they had feelings. And John Burroughs says, you can never be a lover of nature if everything is just a reflection of yourself. That's, and so he wrote this famous thing in the New York Times saying that we need to understand uh, that we need to see nature as it is, not as we want it to be or expect it to be. And John Burroughs was one of the most famous nature writers within the United States in his day. And in the, in the 1800s, wrote extensively a lot of 
uh, novels, and one of them about learning to love and one about learning to use your eyes. It's seeing the world and falling in love with the world as it is, not as we want it to be. He was a profound writer, influenced a lot of environmentalists, including John Muir and Adel Leopold and people who came after him who credited John uh, Burroughs for helping them see the world the way it really is, not as we think it should be. His cabin, Slab Sides, is still there. Uh, it's in now a little park, and you can actually hike to it. He left their con his contents. You can look in the window and see the stuff as he left it. It's only opened a couple of days a year. Uh, we may be able to find those days, but uh, generally you can hike up to the cabin. John Burroughs, when he died, his family just closed the doors and left it and left all the stuff inside of there. Uh, so that might be kind of a nice, fun trip as well. The other one is of cold, is cold Spring Harbor Laboratory. Anyone familiar with that? Yeah. <laughs> Your granddaughter works there. We have an insider. It's, I call it the promise and the peril. Of course, the thing I always remember about Cold Spring, uh, I'll tell you about the good stuff first, of course, is there's Watson and Crick. Uh, uh, Francis Crick and James Watson were working in the laboratories when they discovered the double helix. Cold Spring Harbor is now one of the leading uh, DNA study places for cancer research and cancer medicines uh, and to figuring out all of this kind of stuff. Unfortunately, in the 20s and 30s, it was also one of the heyday places of the eugenics movement uh, in the United States, as they also thought that we could maybe weed out, now that we're understanding genetics and how they work, weed out of the population those who are less desirable, which of course was used in the 30s by people in the, across the ocean in, in much more disastrous ways. So Long Island has its own place there. So it's a place of tremendous science and creativity, which it continues to be. In fact, James Watson, who is the guy here on the left, who kind of continued to have some very, very uh, upsetting and depressing ideas about race in this country. They eventually took his name off of everything, including the research laboratory, but he was the director there for like 30 years. It's still, it's an interesting place to go. It's a brilliant laboratory. Uh, they are very forward and progressive to this day. They renounced everything that had in the past and they have exhibits about those, these two. And we can also make a, a trip over to Cold Spring Harbor and to see that. And I throw that out as another ethical adventure, the thinking of the implications of all that went on in that place. Now, I think we need to go on a Day of the Dead tour, <laughs> our own little Day of the Dead tour. Anybody know what this is? That's Felix Adler's headstone. If you go to Valhalla, New York, you see all these gigantic, this is not Valhalla, but you see all these gigantic, beautiful, wonderful mausoleums, and you go, which of these is Felix Adler? And they take you over to a little Japanese maple and you lift up a branch, and there is Felix Adler, Helen Goldmark Adler. She's buried there too, under that rock. That's his tombstone, Valhalla, New York. Uh, that's where Al Black is buried. Uh, that's where Jerome Nathanson is buried. That's where uh, uh, Rube Goldberg, who knows who Rube Goldberg is? Yeah, you know him, you don't know. You, uh, yeah, the Goldberg, uh, Rube Goldberg, Rube, Rube, well, how do you say it? Yeah, Rube Goldberg machine. Uh, it's also where the parents of Lauren and Hart, mom of Laurel and uh, Laurel, Stan Laurel, and they're buried nearby as well. Um, yeah, right there from Patterson, New Jersey, right? That's where they did their opening shows was there at the, uh, over there before that. And that's where they started the Who's on First routine was over at Patterson, New Jersey. Yeah, uh, but it's a nice cemetery to go. You can walk through Valhalla, New York. Across the street is another cemetery where Babe Ruth is buried. Uh, uh, Ayn Rand is buried there, is a, a quite more challenging figure, but also not far, not in that cemetery, but right across the street from there. Sleepy Hollow is also a nice cemetery. Yeah, it's a very, very nice sleepy cemetery as well. And then we could go down to Woodlawn Cemetery where you could see uh, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, the women's movement, the Pulitzer, Herman Melville, uh, uh, Duke Ellington, all these famous people who ended up in New York were buried there. Has anyone done the Woodlawn tour? You have. Where'd you go? 
Huh? This wood hall and this is a wood lawn in the Bronx. This is the one in the Bronx. The other one is the big one, Greenwood. Yeah, yeah. This is a pretty famous one, but it's a nice way to go through. Uh, that's where Pulitzer, the Pulitzer Prize guy, uh, he's buried there. That's where uh, Robert Moses is buried there. Uh, there are a lot of people buried in the same place. And it's interesting to go, and it reminds you of the tremendous uh, history of New York City to go to one place and see so many people who are buried in the same place, hundreds of famous the New Yorkers and learn those stories. It might be kind of fun to go in the stall, including a first stop at Felix Adler's grave right there. I'm kind of moved that it's such a simple stone, <laughs> right? He was such a profound thinker, such a great guy, the guy who founded the ethical culture movement, uh, and that's his headstone right there. So that might be a kind of a trip to go in as well. Now, the other one is to talk about how things can come back from the dead, and that includes the Bronx River. The Bronx River at one time was one of the most polluted places in America. It was horribly, horribly polluted, but it just shows you the power of restoration, that you know that they're finding beavers now in the Bronx River in the Bronx uh, that have found made their way back up into this river. You can actually canoe it. I've done this trip. It's a lot of fun because the last two portions of it, first you go through the zoo, the Bronx Zoo. So you're canoeing along and people are looking at you like, and then if you look up, if you're lucky, you'll see the water buffalo gazing from the edge, looking down at you like, I wish I could be in the water rather than this fake water. But that's kind of a fun place. And then you canoe through the New York Botanical Gardens. If you've ever been to the grist mill there, you've seen that creek right there. Uh, you canoe right through there and then right through the other side and come out. Uh, there's one ford. That means you have to pick up your canoe and walk over some, some hills. It's not as difficult as it looks. This is, this is three quarters of the way from where you're going, but there's a waterfall here. So you have to bring your canoe down and relaunch it. But uh, that's quite an adventure. It's free. This is one of the things that the Bronx River Alliance, another partner I've worked with in the past, puts on. But it gives you an idea of what's possible, how you could take any place, even some of the most polluted places in America and most densely populated and create urban wildlife corridors and green spaces once again. So that may be a trip people may want to do. Now, the other one uh, I'll mention here, of course, is the Queens Museum of Art who's been there. Couple of you, inside is this gigantic map of the entire area, Yes, you've been there? It's this giant map, right, of Manhattan. Say it again. It's called the World's Fair when I was there. Oh, you were there at the World's Fair. The map was commissioned by Robert Moses. Uh, it is exact map. So it's exactly the layout of Manhattan. The, everything is to scale. It's only 1% or some tiny fraction out of scale. Uh, you could adopt a building and you can actually, they'll have designed the building and pay for it. And they'll put your one little building in, the, in this map as long as it's exactly the scale and things like that. And it was used for city planning. Robert Moses used this also for talking about infrastructure and where he built all his infamous highways and bridges, uh, which now kind of messed up the city to a certain extent. But what's great about it is to be able to look down and see the entire, at least from that area of the shore. Unfortunately, it's not Jersey, but it gives you kind of a whole area of places to look at and things like that. And it puts things in perspective. And I think sometimes it's nice to go there. There's a group there that does an uh, 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 experiential art exhibit, exhibit called Mapiana. Uh, it's a Spanish group. And what you do is they go in there and they take all of us who are all immigrants to the area uh, to a certain extent. And you tell a part of your story and it's kind of this map ritual that they have. And that might be kind of a fun thing to do there. And I like this also because right next to there, you know, a mile away is Jackson Heights. Anyone gone there shopping or eating or dining lately? The most... Jackson Heights is the, uh, the place in the United States that is the most racially diverse place on the planet. There are 162 languages spoken in Jackson Heights, 162 languages, all these foods and restaurants, and there's not one ethnic group that dominates. And it's nice to go to Jackson Heights and just look at the diversity of our planet, our food, our languages, our entertainment, uh, those kinds of stuff. And that's kind of a fun trip you can make as well. Yes, ma'am. I went to Newtown High School, which is in, you know, the 
years. Uh -huh. And we used to go up there at the Jackson Heights, but it was it was a little bit empty. It was very brief. So you could go up there and get good seats. Yep. Yep, you can still see that as you're heading closer towards Astoria, a lot of the Greek places. And now that's that's Czech and Polish and some of the best Czech restaurants and Polish restaurants are in that area. But the Greeks are right around the corner as well. And I, to me, from coming from South Texas, you walk down the street and you go, wow, <laughs> look at our planet. Look at the people. It's pretty amazing. So. Here's my question to you. Want to have some fun? Does any of these sound fun to you? Yeah. Any of those things like places you want to do? Yeah. So it's time to go on a little bit of adventure and to go do something. I highly recommend and, and see me for these. And I, I left off the obvious things. People can say, well, what about this? What about that? I go, you know about those places. I didn't have to tell you about that. I want to show you some of the other things that we could do and talk about. And in fact, if anybody wants to go on one of these trips, I will organize it this summer and I'll get a van and we'll do an easy one. Or we could do a harder one up here. Some of you are walkers and want to do this. Now, not everybody can do this and some people don't have the time or you already have plans. But if you wanted to do, does anybody want to add to these things? Something that's in the area that I didn't mention about those places? Yes. Yeah, it's on my list. And it's the, uh, what remains of the radio telescope that was used to discover the background radiation proving the Big Bang. It's at uh, the Bell Labs site. I cannot remember the, towel, the town in New Jersey, probably about an hour away. That it is still there. And uh, there are some small exhibits there. I believe I've never been. It's been on my list for a while. And um, it resulted in one of probably a dozen Nobel Prizes that were won from workers at the Great Bell Labs. Yep, the Ram Horn radio attendant is still there. Has anybody seen it? In fact, I drove over there because I saw it on a map. I said, what the heck? It's in New Jersey? And I thought, I drove around there, drove past gates that said, do not enter, and I passed a sign that says, check in, and drove past that, and drove up right up to the ram horn. It took a look at it. I was like, I said, what are they going to do? Arrest me for looking at the ram's horn antenna. Uh, and so, yeah, we should do that trip as well. So that'd be another fun one. You have one. There you go. Take that. The famous uh, that. studio. That is now a museum and it's just wonderful. It's a beautiful Noguchi. It has a wonderful Zen garden. Where's the Noguchi Museum located? In Long Island City. Hold that close to your room. Long Island City. It's in Long Island City. It's fabulous. What's so great about the Noguchi Museum? Well, he was a great sculptor. Uh, okay. And there's a lot of his work there. It's a beautiful garden there, too. Beautiful. So there's a Zen garden and the Noguchi, Noguchi Sculptor Museum in Long Island City. It's so beautiful. Yeah, that's Queens or Brooklyn. Yeah, Queens. Queens over that area right there is another one. All right, let's hear of other ideas. Yep, and then we're gonna take some ideas from Zoom. In West Orange, New Jersey is the Thomas Edison National Historical Park. And there's also his, uh, his mansion nearby in Llewellyn Park. Uh, so those are two highlights that are very close by. And then if you're hungry afterwards, you go to the What's the name of that place on High Street? Yeah, the, uh, the, the Star Star Tavern. The Star Tavern makes fabulous pizza. Yeah, thank you. I how many of you have been to the Edison Museum? Really, I left that one off because I thought so many of you had been there. Tremendously cool place to go because the scientists and the people that work there once again just left their stuff and walked out the door, and it's still all there. Uh, you can actually they have old uh, wax imprint Victorias. They play the music for you. Uh, you can explore the stuff and and visit that, uh, and then go down to Menlo Park. Uh, down by Edison, New Jersey, uh, and then also see the big gigantic light bulb down there. And there's another museum too, because he had two workshop areas and they were both worth visiting. Not that I've ever been. I've been to both of them because they're really cool places. You just go see them. So yeah, I like those too. All right, other ideas, adventures. Uh, yes, anyone on Zoom has some ideas for adventures you've been on or you'd like to go on? Uh, we are still in your uh, screen where I'm not seeing any hands raised, but we still have a shared screen here. I don't know if I can deactivate that. There we go. Um, yeah, no, no hands raised at the moment. Any anybody 
on Zoom. All right, we have one more from this room. I'll let other people in line think about it. Dan, come on up. So I didn't hear you mention, can you hear me through the mask? Yeah. Good. Uh, I talk loud enough anyway. I didn't hear you mention uh, the um, Brooklyn Botanic Garden and Prospect Park, uh, which is uh, the other big, uh, what's his name? The same guy who developed Central Park. Robert, um, oh. uh, Olmstead. Yeah, Olmstead. Who's uh, also buried in Woodlawn Cemetery. Oh, and by the way, he also did Branch Brook Park in, in Newark and uh, Delville. Um, but uh, that's another fabulous place and uh, well worth uh, well worth a visit. Cherry blossoms are exquisite. We go every year. Yeah. And if you if you go up to Newburgh, you can see the Vol Hall uh, homestead. He's the other architect of Central Park, uh, and uh, his gardens and his designs and all those things are in the houses as well. Anyone else online? All right, so we're going to take a chance to vote for just a second. If you wanted to go on these trips and online, you've got a little button at the bottom that says chat. And if you click on that, you just put which of those trips, and I'll put them back up again if I could. And we'll let everybody select here. Do we have to only choose one? <laughs> one, I will organize the rest you will do on your own, of course. All right. Um, I'll take a vote in this room. Oh, there you go. There, East River Jackson Heights. It has changed since then. Oh, my God. Uh, Evelyn, thank you for sharing that. I'm sure it has changed quite a bit. Um, I thought Newtown Creek was in Brooklyn by the, G the Gowanus Expressway. You're absolutely correct, Elliot. It's actually between those two. As you're going across the Kosciuszko Bridge, you see it down on the right hand. And it lights up at night. It has this kind of uh, blue iridescent color, and it's really gorgeous if you go to see there. And if you go to the museum, they light it up at night, and once uh, they do that again. So we have the Stonewall and African Burial Ground, Gotham's Green, uh, Stonewall, uh, Gotham Greens and Newtown Creek, Ellis Island, Liberty Science Center, Great Swamp National Wildlife Refuge, Rose Reading Room, United Nations, John Burrell Slapsides, Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory, Valhalla, Red Lawn Cemeteries, Canoe, the Bronx River, Panorama of the City of New York. So everybody can vote now online and I'll look at yours otherwise. How about in the room? Uh, let's hear where you'd like to go if you were to go on a group trip where? Jackson Heights, Jackson Heights. yeah, to go see uh, whole head over there and then go see the great map. Anybody else want to go somewhere, Susan, this summer? Gotham Greens and the, the, the Digester. Gotham Greens and the Digester. Canoeing on the Bronx River. Yay! A lot of fun. Canoeing the Bronx River. I may have to organize one on one. Anyone else? Cold Spring Harbor. Cold Spring Harbor, yeah. Maybe we have an inside tour there. That'd be great if she could do it. What does she do there? She's a PhD student. Oh, she thinks she's smart. She thinks she knows a lot. She is smart, it sounds like, right? Yeah. Okay, great. And we have some other ones. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take these into consideration. I'm going to make a flyer. We'll put some dates together and then hopefully go on a big trip. Okay? Thank you all. I see some other ones. Cold Spring is pretty lengthy ride from here. It is a little bit of a ride. Uh, but it's a nice, beautiful ride over that area of Long, Long Island. And I see Jackson Heights, Gotham Greens, Jackson Heights. So the cemetery tours and things like that. Um, we, in our remaining time, by the way, uh, hold on a sec. <laughs> yeah, I agree with you. This is a time for us also to show some appreciation and gratitude, we didn't get to have the installment dinner this year. And the reason being is because uh, all the other stuff is going on. And then we had the May 15th and we had some funerals and it just was too much uh, the people. So we're gonna take just a moment to thank the community builders here at the Ethical Society. As you know, this is a quarter of the end of our season. We have a new board that just recently coming in uh, and uh, wanna thank everybody who's worked on this. I think uh, Susan Lesh and Lisa Schwartz helped pull together some of the nominations, right? You did not, you, Lisa Schwartz, yeah. 
And then Elaine, of course, once again, who is my archivist and the person who pulls around all the different kinds of things. Elaine, uh, thank you so much. But it's an opportunity for us to quickly to kind of pay attention to some of the people who helped contribute this year and things like that. First off, we had some long-term members. And normally, if we would be here and they would be in the room, we would be presenting them with a new Rolls-Royce car and a trip to, but because we can't do that, we had to send the Rolls-Royce back. Uh, Gloria Smith, who's been a member for 65 years. Yeah, that's this many. Ugh. My hand's cramping, Ugh, that's this many. Uh, and then Gene Strickholm, who's been a member for 60 years. Yep, both online. And uh, Gloria, I think you said it better that we all wax and wane in our tension, but community takes effort, it takes commitment, and we try and make it work. And these two women have devoted years of their lives to helping to make this community work. And we just wanted to take a moment to thank them for everything. So thank you so much. Uh, Jean or Gloria, did you want to say something real quick? I'm going to stop sharing. You don't have to, by the way. Um, I could say something, Kurt. Go ahead, Gloria. It's been a very thrilling experience to belong to the Ethical Society. I did have my first four years at the Ethical School in New York. So I recognize that building. And I look forward to a very exciting future as long as I live with our new leader, because I think we're going in a very interesting and new direction. And I find that very exciting. Thank you, Gloria. Yeah. And Jean, did you want to say something? Otherwise known as Zoom user? <laughs> Um, the Ethical Society has been very central in my life. Um, I met my husband, Harry, at the New York Society Young Adult Group back in, goodness, 1955. We were married by Henry Herman. And my kids went to the Sunday school Um I was very influenced by the society and work at fair housing and uh, adopting our son, Glenn. And I hope to continue the connection. I'm so grateful to be a member. That's it. Thank you very much. And congratulations to both of y'all. In fact, we were, when I was installing the bricks in there, I put in one for, for Harry Strickham. So uh, very nice as well. So yes. I want to mention we have another longtime member who's here, but her her years in the society are not divisible by five. So we did not include her. But since she's here, Marianne Claxton is here, who's in her 62nd year. 62nd year, wow. Okay, so in three more years, we're gonna Yeah, this is the society has this weird tradition where you only call out for certain people. I'm like, what about these people who've been here for a long time? Yes, ma'am, want to say something? First day. Uh, I was told that the cult, ethical culture is meeting at the ladies club, the women's club, and that's not here. And I went straight over there and joined. And there was Sam Coltman, one of the founders of our society, and many other famous ones, Alice Wilkinson, a whole bunch of people who now are gone quite a while, but uh, they did make, uh, make um, a very strong thrust for this continue, to continue, to buy this building, to put us in here. And they are the ones who really deserve the credit for our being in this gorgeous building. They really went out of their way to make sure we got it. Great, they thank you. Wonderful. Alice Wilkinson, Bill Wilkinson. Well, Alice Wilkinson, Bill Wilkinson. They're very, uh, they were the mother and father of the society. And I think it's so important that we remember things like that. That's the reason we have these kinds of uh, kind of celebrations to pay attention to people who put in so much work. Share my screen one more time. Did I mention Sam Coltman? Yeah. We have our new officers, of course. Um, 
We had a difficult year, a lot went through. We got tested in a lot of different ways, right? Not only did we dealing with a pandemic, uh, which has kept a lot of people out of the room and made us separate, uh, you know, it's made it much more difficult in, in so many different ways. Uh, we had some other incidences that happened here that we also struggled and wrestled with and debated. Uh, and despite all that, people didn't give up. And, uh, you know, that tells me what they really ultimately believed in was this community. Thank you so much. But we had some people helped us get through there. Uh, there's our new line uh, pres uh, officers again, Jim Norman. <laughs> He may have been the right person at the right time to come in and say the things that he did and, and keep us moving forward. Eric Sanhusen, who is also online, uh, who I think has tremendously sharp uh, uh, understanding and brain in helping us to figure things out as well. Tracy Kelly's coming back to work with us again on the board. So happy to have her. Tracy was the president at one time, wasn't she? Yeah. Yep. So here we have another. Uh, someone who really knows what's going on. Lucy's moving away to Florida. Um, that's um, okay, but uh, there we go. And then we have our bird address Steez there, uh, as Sandroff, Ron Schwartz, Ed Gross with membership, the building, Ed Lipner, um, and Javier, right, on there? As the chair. Yeah, as the chair, I see. Yeah. Social action continue will be Ann Wallman in her third year of doing that. Ethical education, Mary Lavelle, and the platform with Elaine Fondiller, who helps me out with so much we're on here. We also have to thank our kind of standing community of Sylvia Costa with Adult Ed. Social affairs, Athena, taking over from Diane. You, yeah, it's a name only. She's not here, so we can all know that she's gonna, there we go. <laughs> Afina, you're always here helping out, uh, and, and Edna, you know, thank you so much for making this possible. Uh, Joanna Ebert, the family programming and good stuff, uh, publicity and promotions, Teresa Forsman and Terry Karp, who despite one in Kansas and one currently in Bath in England, huh? Nebraska, they're all the same, why don't you leave it? Nebraska, Kansas, uh, and Terry Karp in Bath in England is where she is right now. Uh, run our communications and our platform, and they are on top of it. They are extremely sharp people to do that. And welcome, Susan Lesh is going to be working with us on festivals this year. So, yay! It'll be a lot more fun there. And, the, <laughs> and then our special communities we are nominating with Lisa, Eric, Diane Gross, Tracy Kelly, and B. Gapoyan, whose name I slaughtered last time, and I told B. I was going to wait to this moment to say, I apologize, B. Everybody wants to be known by their right name, uh, Gapoyan. She wrote me, and I'm going to write her back but, uh, for that. Uh, recognition, Elaine Fondiller and Ed Gross. Uh, leadership Advisory, Wes Mansuri, Ron Schwartz, Tracy Kelly, Dwight Pinozo, uh, and Diana Gross. And then, of course, Commemorative Fund, Ann Wallman, uh, Alpanas Sector. Alpina Sichter, Ruth Olson, Dan Rosenblum, thank you, Ron Schwartz, uh, and then the endowment, Jim Norman, Lucy Lattice, and Esther Sandros. It's a lot of work running a society because of all the stuff that we have going on. And these people have stepped up time and time and time and time again, all of you in this room, of course. Uh, but if anybody else wants to step up and help with that, we appreciate it as well. And then finally, much thanks to people who are transitioning off. Uh, Amy Brett Cass, who served as the secretary for many years, she's moving off. Uh, Diana Kozarski, who we all, we know she's not going very, very far, but she'll be back. She's at another film festival, I believe, this weekend. So congratulations, her husband wrote the book. It's doing very well. They've got a lot of rewards, celebrations, much deserved right there. And they're basking in all of that. And I would tell them to suck it all up and enjoy it. I just spoke with Amy Baker Fine yesterday who's trying to new ways to engage our youth, uh, but uh, she's transitioning off the nominating committee and thank her for her work. And of course, Janet Glass, who worked with us all the way up to the last moment of her life, uh, you know, deeply miss her, but uh, the leadership advisory. So thanks to all them who made that possible. And thank you, thank you who are still around. So let's get a little round of applause for them. Uh, the Celine Katz Scholarship, we had a conversation about what to do with the money. Uh, this summer, we're going to have our youth 
core here, a team of you, and we decided to donate the $1,500 directly of the scholarship money directly to that of our climate resiliency core that we're going to be having in house. So that's where that money goes. And thanks to the Celine Katz family uh, for, for making that possible for so many years. So. Okay, we're almost to the end here of our day and we'll be pulling those kinds of things together. Um, excuse me one second. Do we have any additional announcements other than what are in your program? I do remind everybody next week, please come out and support the youth. Uh, they're gonna be having their uh, coming of age ceremony. There'll be three of them uh, there. To, Yesterday, the youth all gathered at Sam, Samantha Stankevich's home, and they had their nearby lake party, uh, 27, 25 of them or whatever it was. It's pretty amazing. So that if you wonder where the families are, they'd probably be all uh, marshmallowed out. So let's hope they've all had a wonderful time. Any other announcements or things that we need to do, David? Thank you. This is predominantly for people here in the room. So, you know, we're having a picnic, uh, uh, a bring your own lunch after platform. So we have a new food choice on the corner of Elm and Cedar Lane. Cedar Lane. Uh, it's called the uh, Platter House. They have Mediterranean food. And I can tell you that the Blandlesh family and the Fondilla Rosenblum family can personally vouch for their falafel sandwiches. They are terrific. And I can tell you also they have a wonderful baba ganu. And I have menus here. No worries. That was a payoff, right? They're giving you money for that. So make sure that happens. Any other announcements? Anybody online have an announcement? I don't think so. I think we're, uh, let me just, yeah, I think we're all right. Well, thank you. I think it's important. Uh, next week, I will not be here. Unfortunately, uh, I'm going to my mother's own memorial. I will be scattering her ashes in the Pacific Ocean, her and my dad. Uh, so I'm heading out there to San Diego to, to do that. Uh, it's been a tough year, right, for all of us, an extremely tough year. We've lost some amazing people in our lives. Uh, the pandemic just seems to go on and on. And so I think it's good to remember that while we remember them, that we're still alive. We're still moving forward and we had to make those choices. You know, Mark Twain said that travel is fatal to prejudice, bigotry, and narrow-mindedness. Yeah, it's fatal to those things. And the more that we can get out there, the more it opens up our world, the more that we enjoy it, the more we can see things. And I think it's an ethical responsibility. I really do think it's a spiritual value of, of adventuring. And it doesn't have to be very far. It could then have to be just to a new place and seeing something new and getting out of the ruts and seeing the world that we uh, is much bigger than it is. Uh, John Muir said, the world is big and I want to have a good look at it before it gets dark. And uh, I think that's the best way to put. Have a great, fun, wonderful Sunday. Join us for lunch if you're in the area. Thank you for coming in online. Uh, and everybody have a fantastic summer. Thank you. All right. Thank you, everyone. We are going to let me see if I can I think they already signed off, as a matter of fact. So it's only us here. The meeting house is gone. So congratulations, uh, B, um, sorry, Jean and Gloria. And uh, I guess we will see you all next week. Gloria, Bye, everyone. Thank you very much. Oh. Thank you. Okay. Gloria, can I talk? Hi. Say something to Gloria? Yes. Sure, go ahead. Uh, okay, Gloria, this is Teresa. Right. Bye. I felt the same way you did about Linda Bennett, and I couldn't even talk during her memorial. So I still miss our long talks. And I'm trying very hard to remember the good and not feel so bad about the loss. Right. She really involved me with a, a lot of things. She never said anything she shouldn't say. But things like maybe, how could we enlarge the parking lot or construction at the building? So it renewed my interest what was going on in the society and the building. 
having been yes. a long time member, you go through activity lows, activity lows. She revitalized it. She was quite an incredible person. Yes, I think so too. Well, very nice. I, I haven't taken her number out of my phone yet, so I know I'm not ready to move on. <laughs> well, we developed a relationship, a friendship. Uh, we went to the Shakespeare Theater down in Madison mm -hmm. together with some of my friends and things like that. So there was a nice relationship there. Yeah. yeah. I knew about her family, her children, her grandchildren, Matthew, you know. The whole yeah. Thing. Is, is, um, is there a list of the places that Kurt just talked about that we could look at to decide which ones to choose? And um, I'm, I'm directing this to... You know what? Uh, I, it's you. Uh, sorry. I, well, I did while he was doing this. I, I was uh, writing some things down, but I didn't get it all. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, let me see if, let me see if it'll, let me see if this will work. I'm going to try to see if this will work here. Oh, thank you. I was writing it down too. How about that? Okay, so now wait, if I open this up, how do I save it? Um, can I save oh, it? That's a good question. How do you save that? Uh, what I would say is select, you can like I'm mouse, to, I'm, like I'm select it with the it. text. Yeah, if you, if you can grab it. If you're it's on not, a phone, I don't know if you can do I'm it. I'm on a phone and I can't I can't yeah. seem to, to copy it. You know what can, you could do then? Do a screenshot yes. of the phone. Oh, that's if a great idea. If you can idea. get it so you do it, do a screenshot yes, and then yes, it's in yes, your photos. That's a great idea. Okay, let's see. That's a great idea. Let's see if I could do that. Then I could save it as a picture. Yep. Oh, wow. Oh, you did a great job writing everything down. I, I uh <laughs> I was trying to take notes and like write about the things so I can remember what they were. Um, yeah. That's wonderful. Yeah, I was so just, w when he put the one sheet up at the end that had everything listed, I was like, because I didn't know if they were going to want me to tally things. I was like. Oh, <laughs> so, sorry, right? oh no, that, I didn't even, I didn't, I missed that sheet. I must have, I think I got a phone call for a quick second. Oh. I must have missed it. Um, yeah, he threw it up at the end. So. Oh, wow. That's great. Wonderful. Yeah, those were great suggestions. I can't believe I didn't know about some of them. I, and I try to yeah. stay on top of it. He's yeah. so he's he's so involved and so so aware of so many things that the average person's not. You mm -hmm. know, so You're right. I, I hope we get, I hope we get to go to some. That would be so so wonderful. Yeah, I think he said he's gonna. He may try to organize a, a couple of them. So he said that. He said that. But I guess we'll be notified when he does. But he was also asking yeah. us to for some input as to which ones we might like. You know, so right. Right, so, yeah. Email and getting them, I'm sure a van. Love to hear from you. What a wonderful idea getting a van so we don't have to deal mm -hmm. with all the parking and transportation issues, you know. Mm -hmm. That's right. That would be so wonderful. Well, That's thank right. you for that. Sure. Absolutely. Thank you all for attending. Um thank you, anybody Ron. want to say anything else or you're no, welcome. I'm gonna leave. Wish everyone a wonderful summer and see you here be on the Zoom for the summer. Very same, good. Same here. Enjoy. Bye bye. Okay. Rob, what right. is the summer schedule? What is the what? The summer schedule? What is the summer schedule. Uh, so the summer schedule, I oh, think yeah. I have it. Uh, where is it? I, I don't know that I can share it, but it's where is it? It's uh, the summer schedule is still every week except July 3rd. Mm -hmm. There's no, no platform that day. There's no plat platform on Labor Day, September 4th. Okay. Um, there is an AEU All Society platform on July 24th, um, and that's it. Then there's still platforms every other Sunday. The difference is, is that during the summer it's at 10 a.m., not 11. A a oh, oh, really? Oh, okay, yeah. that's good to know. Huh. Yeah, to try to get everything done so that you can get on and enjoy the rest of your day. Exactly, that's a great so. idea. So, um, yeah. Thank you. Have a wonderful rest of your week. Thank you. Absolutely. Everybody Thank enjoy you, the day. I'm, glad, I'm very glad you're continuing the Zoom in the summer. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Yeah, we're, we're excited about it. Do you think Thanks you're so going to be con continuing Zoom for the indefinite future or is it hard to I, say? I think at the moment that is the answer. Yes. Um, I, I don't if it can work because it only requires, you know, the thing is it requires two people. It requires a Zoom coordinator and it requires a hybrid 
person in the oh. room to make sure. Oh. So it's, you know, the only um, way we, I think we would discontinue the Zoom would be as if we don't have enough people to, or if one week we don't have two people who can run the two things. Okay. So, and, and that's, I can also say that's, that's not impossible. That, that could happen where all of a sudden we're like, we don't have anyone to do it. But I'm sure we will let you know as soon as possible in advance. Right. So. And understandable. People people go away in the summer sometimes, so it's understandable. Exactly. Exactly. So, but but I think we're, we're, we're you know, emails go around with the group of us. So Eric Sandhusen is the one who's assigning people and sort of figuring out who can do what. Mm -hmm. I think for the time being, we're covered. But in terms of indefinitely, we'll see what happens. Good to know. And thank you for for, do, for doing it. I appreciate that. My pleasure. Yes. My pleasure. Thank Have a great day, everyone. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.